The purpose of this video is to talk about Jabberwocky, the poem by Lewis Carroll that was originally found in Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. So it's one of the Alice in Wonderland um, little stories that Lewis Carroll wrote. And I find that in teaching Jabberwocky in the past, a lot of students read through a stanza or two and realize how many words they don't understand, which is completely normal. I'm just kind of give up on the poem, but I think that the poem is wonderfully written, fun to read, and super interesting to talk about. Um, it might not necessarily, and there are certainly scholars out there that would disagree with what I'm about to say, but it might not necessarily uh, hold the most weighty um, and important interpretation regarding Victorian lit, but it's definitely fun to talk about. So um, I want to go through it with you here. Now, I'm going to read it, but I want to say that um, YouTube has a reading by Benedict Cumberbatch, and I strongly encourage you to go down the rabbit hole of listening to various people read this poem because they all do it differently and it's really fun and I but I really like his reading so um, if you're you know checking out these notes you can play the YouTube video. Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy wore the bora groves and the mome wraths out grabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the maxim foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whiffling through the tulgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy wore the bora groves, and the mome wraths out grabe. Okay, so that's, that's how the words are pronounced, how Lewis Carroll wanted the words pronounced, um, particularly with the hard G's on gyre and gimbal, with the uh, slithy is how I want to say that word, but he wants it to be pronounced slithy. Uh, wraths, he says, should rhyme with baths. So in his writing of this poem, he also told people how to pronounce it, and uh, in the readings you will see that kind of similar pronunciation throughout if someone's familiar with those. So this is the poem, seven stanzas. I think that the first thing to do to fully appreciate the poem is to just figure out what's going on. Um, and so I'm going to walk through each stanza in a quick way and talk about it. Stanzas one and seven you'll notice are exactly the same. They're the same four lines, same punctuation, same words, and I think that that's interesting. It could be interpreted in a number of ways, you know, um, does that mean that throughout this story everything goes back to normal or knowing what has happened in the story, do we interpret stanza seven differently than we interpret stanza one? Possibly. Um, Lewis Carroll starts his poem with twas, and that really reminds me of twas the night before Christmas. So what that tells me is he's following a very normal standard pattern of narration He's setting the scene for us in the first stanza. Twas brillig and the slithy toves. And when you, if you choose to look at the interpretations of all of these words, because scholars have gone through and tried to figure out, you know, what is Carol saying by making up all of these words? And in some cases, we have these really solid agreed upon um, definitions. In other cases, there's unique interpretations. I'll give you one of mine at some point in this video. Um, but here, some of the, the ways that the words are interpreted give you the sense that there's some unrest in this 
scene. So something in nature is feeling a little bit weird. Um, for example, the word slithy is one of Carol's famous mashup words. That's what I'm calling them, although I'll give you some other words to use. Uh, sly and writhe. And to writhe is like to twist and turn in an uncomfortable way. Sly is something, you know, where you're not being super honest. You're maybe possibly manipulative. And so that really just looking at that word suggests that what's happening in the world in nature here is like it's uncomfortable something weird going on um maybe even a little bit of devilishness brillig one of the things that carol does in his other texts is define some of these words so uh when alice meets humpty dumpty um he, she asks him what does this mean? And what does that mean? And what about this? And he'll give an, an explanation. And so Humpty Dumpty says Brillig refers to 4 p.m., which is the time when you start broiling things for dinner. Okay, um, so here we have this stanza one. It's setting the scene, and we're going to see it repeated in stanza seven to kind of end, bring us full circle around as, as that narrative arc kind of does. Stanza two, um, Carol presents the conflict. So if we're thinking about the narrative arc, we have um, the setting, we have the rising action, we have the conflict, we have the falling action, and we have the resolution. Setting is called something else, but I can't think of it right now. So the conflict is being presented in stanza two. It begins with quotation marks, which tells us as readers, someone besides the speaker of the whole poem, or what we could call the narrator in like a story, someone else is talking here. This person who's talking says, my son, which tells us that it's like a father talking to his actual son, or um, it's like a father figure. Maybe there's a difference here in age and wisdom. Um, you know, think about all of your, like, mystery type stories or fantasy stories where there's usually that older character who kind of knows um, there's something weird going on but it takes that younger character to, character to uh, resolve that conflict or something like that so there's a um, like a, a mentor type role that's played in a lot of this fantasy and we're seeing that in how the conflict is being presented and of course this this speaker at the time in stanza two says beware which tells us that there's dangerous beasts out there now in carol's formatting of the poem, he capitalizes certain words, and I think these are like the proper nouns, the names of the beasts that this person should be aware of. So of course we have our title character, Jabberwock, the Jab Jabberwocky, the Jabberwock, we have the Jub Jub Bird, and we have the Bandersnatch, which I feel like the word snatch sounds particularly aggressive, you know, just taking something really quickly. And it, and um, you know, he says the, the jaw, let me go back, he says the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. So we, we know we've got something particularly nasty here in the Jabberwock. And, and this is included, I mean, we can really associate who has jaws that bite and claws that catch. Well, it's the Jabberwock because um, this is all, if we want to think of it in sentence, these first two lines are all one sentence. There's no ending punctuation until here. So that's all connected together. Okay, so the Jabberwock is um, kind of a mean guy. Then we have in stanza three sort of this rising action. The protagonist of the poem is preparing for this fight. Um, the protagonist is going out and looking for the whatever. He's looking for his battle partner is what I'm calling it. Um, and he looks for so long that he has to kind of take a rest under a tree. So we have almost like an adventure story here. This uh, kid is going out looking for the adventure um, or trying to resolve this problem that stanza one is giving us in nature. Then we get into stanza four, which is the big climax. Here comes one of the beasts. It almost seems like it's coming 
out of nowhere, you know, he's resting by the tree and bam, out pops the Jabberwock and they have to fight. And that's what we get in stanza five, um, you know, one, two, one, two, through and through. So I imagine this as like the protagonist stabs the beast with the sword and cuts off um, his head. Now, if you're familiar with Alice in Wonderland, then you'll notice that association between the queen off with, off with her head, and that's really interesting, off with their head, off with his head, so she does kind of people's heads off, um, which is a, a fascinating element to interpret for a bit much bigger text. Okay, so we have this rising action, the climax has happened, the beast is dead, now what? So our hero, our protagonist, takes the head back to the father of the father figure. We see quotation marks again, so we know that someone, one of the actual characters of the poem, is speaking. It is probably the same person who's speaking before. We have that repetition of my son, my beamish boy, right? So beaming, right? Think of you're proud, you're beaming, um, but a little, because it's just ish, you know, a little bit of beaming. Um, and there's um, just words of celebration. Kalu, Kale, you think, like, yell those out loud. Um, and it's excitement and happiness, and the word joy is in this stanza as well. Um, and then in stanza seven, we kind of have this, again, it's the resolution, but I think there are two ways to interpret this stanza. One is, everything is back to normal, the poem ended how it started. So we have come full circle. The other way to interpret this, um, possibly the more interesting way, is to say, okay, the words are the same, but do we read them differently knowing now that this big beast is dead? Is the slivy still mean what it did before? I don't know if that's correct, but isn't it possible? Okay, so one of the things that you'll notice that maybe gives some students uh, a challenge or possibly say, you know what, I don't, I'm going to give up on this, is the fact that Carol likes these mashup words. And there are, let's see, where should I put my face? There are a number of things we could call this. Neologism, neologism, neo means new, more contemporary. So what you could think of is, in this case, Carol is making up words for the situation at hand. I see that as an understanding of, even though we have all of these words in the English language, we might not have the best words. And you can think about the fact that there are some cultures and languages that have words for for feelings and we don't have an English word for that because we don't identify that in our language, if that makes any sense. So um, having these new words that Carol creates, sometimes they even are so perfect for the situation that they get incorporated into the English language. For example, you can go to like, Google's dictionary and look up the word galumphing, and it will say it's a blend of triumphant galloping. Like you've won, you know, picture people in battle and the battle is over and they've won and they're on a horse and they're triumphantly galloping around. I, I think of like the Dothraki in Game of Thrones or something along those those lines. Um, and, and so there are words that Carol has created that have been incorporated officially into our language or in as official of a capacity as possible. Chortle, chuckle, and snort. And these are also words that most of our scholars are agreeing upon their meaning. Um, We've talked about Slivy, but we also have Mimsy, which Humpty Dumpty tells us again. So some, again, Carol's characters are defining these words for us that Mimsy means flimsy and miserable. There are some words, however, that um, have a lot of different possible meanings. Scholars might say, oh, well, this could mean one thing, it could mean something else. And this is where I hold on to the, the belief that if it makes sense, however you want to interpret a text, if you can explain it, if you can find the evidence to back up your interpretation, then I think that that's okay. So in this case, um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about this word vorpal because that's one of those example words where even Lewis Carroll was like, uh, I don't really know what it means. Um, and, and one of these these words that I'll give you, you know, I, I said before, uh, neologism, neologism, whatever, however you want to pronounce that. Um, another word is a nonce word, and this is a word that is invented, used for, you know, one-time use, not really going to get incorporated into uh, the collective language, and it might have no meaning except for only within the context of its use one time. And maybe Vorpal is an example of that kind of word where we can't, in, in my thinking, this is an adjective. So now some of these other words are adjectives and they work better as neologisms, words that do get incorporated, but um, Vorpal is describing the sword. So however you want to think about um, the, that mashed up, made up word, I think is perfectly fine. My interpretation, when I hear the word as I'm reading, I think of two words. I think of vortex and I think of purple. And if you Google image, image Google, whatever. If you do a Google search for the image of purple vortex, you're going to see this like cool swirly pattern. It kind of looks like a galaxy, something um, science-y. And I imagine the sword to have, I don't know, even if it's just a gem on it that looks like a purple galaxy, but I think of something else, something different, something more swirly, even in the, the makeup of it. And that's just my interpretation. And I feel confident that, that it's okay for me to interpret it that way. And you guys might interpret it in another way. Um, let me think. I was just reading that there's one scholar who looks at it as... Mm, I can't remember, so I'm not going to tell you. You can maybe Google interpretations of the word vorpal if you want to. Um, the other word that I want to talk about, uh, not from Lewis Carroll, but a word that has an appropriate definition for us is portmanteau, portmanteau, sounds French, um, and this is just what we're talking about here, which is mashup words, where we have two words we understand, such as chuckle and snort, that are mashed together to create a new word with a, a meaning that's derived from both of sort of those original words. Portmanteau how I'm pronouncing it. Okay. Um, I think that all of this aids in this playful, silly, and imaginative place or space that Carol has created. So if you think about it, Jabberwocky was originally published in one of the Alice books, and knowing that Alice is going into Wonderland, which is this made-up space, it's our, our fictional place, it is extremely silly. You know, we get all of our characters uh, that we've Many of us have come to know and love, like uh, the 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 Red Queen, and um, all I can think of is Johnny Depp, the Mad Hatter, um, and the Smiley Cat. What's he called? I can't think of the name. I could just think of that big purple face. Um, so we have all these crazy characters, and I think that just this, the the language reflects the place. And that's just kind of cool to think about that, that, that the language could reflect the place so much and to really pull us into this imaginative space. And also that we're looking at words we don't understand, but if you read the poem a couple of times, even without getting this um, analytical into the, the meanings of these mashup words, you get the gist. And Alice even says that. So this is kind of leading me to... Um, in my interpretation, but Alice even says, you know, I don't really know what this poem is about, but someone's definitely dead, or someone has definitely killed something. So you could you get the general concept, even though this is um, what could be defined as a nonsense poem. Um, and it's just it's a good example of something for children because it's silly and it's fun, um, but it's fun for scholars because while it might just seem silly and fun, you can derive a, a bigger interpretation from it if you wanted to. This slide is just a picture. And there's tons of different depictions of the Jabberwock out there. However, I like this one a lot. It's colorful and, and cartoony and cute. So 
Um, but this is the this is a concept. This is the basic concept that you see with most of the image-based depictions of the Jabberwock, very dragon-like, almost like a Medusa-type dragon. Uh, it can fly, it has big claws, it has big pointy sharp teeth, and, and so this is pretty standard. Um, now I want to talk, because I don't want to just parse out the poem, I want to give a possible interpretation, and I also am doing this to kind of just fuel uh, that interpretive element within you all so that you keep seeing examples of how texts can be interpreted. So I'm just going to, for the remainder of the second half of this video, I'm going to hit the 30 minute mark, I'm just going to talk about my interpretation of what I'm thinking. Um, here is a potential thesis statement for a paper if I were to write this out. While some approach Lewis Carroll's poem Jabberwocky as a nonsense poem written to aid a larger novel, the fact that the poem in Through the Looking Glass had to be read using a mirror, the fact that it is about a victorious boy and is also quickly dismissed by Alice, suggests that Carroll is making a commentary on the difficulty yet powerful nature of self-reflection. All children have the ability to search for, challenge, and defeat their inner struggles. In essence, this is a poem about overcoming challenges. And so I think that if you just read the poem, we see that there in um, the whoever my son, whoever the Beamish boy is, we see that in his defeat of the beast. But if we approach it even more so from where it was included, this super interesting thing comes up. The only way that Alice could read this poem when, uh, was to hold it up in a mirror. And if you've ever played around with this type of writing, it's, it's where you write, like, I don't know if it's upside down and backwards or just backwards, but you can't really read it very well um, or very quickly by looking at it on the page, but when you hold it up to the mirror and you read the reflection, then you can see the actual text as you normally would. So I think that's really interesting that it takes in order to understand. So if this poem is just a classic adventure novel or a classic adventure story and it ends with a hero, but the only way to see that is to look in the mirror, then maybe this is like a possible reflection of Alice. Maybe she needs to look in the mirror and realize that she is a hero. And I think in modern interpretations of Alice in Wonderland, we get that. Uh, there was a movie that came out, I don't know, five to six years ago? It, it was the Alice in Wonderland with Johnny Depp. And Alice slayed the Jabberwocky. So I think that's super interesting how we've taken this interpretation. Um, and, and maybe gone all the way, but I find it fascinating that the only way you can learn of this boy's victory is by looking in a mirror. And what do you see when you look in a mirror? You don't just see the text. Again, if you're holding a book in front of a mirror, you see yourself. And maybe it's even a commentary on just, um, what would that be called? Something like, maybe it's metatextual and the fact that, uh, you can see yourself in a story, and so then maybe Carol is commenting on the story itself. Now, could Carol be taking this even deeper and um, asking the Victorian people to look at themselves in the mirror and what do they see? Yes, certainly possibly, and maybe that's how we could bring in that weirdness with the setting. Is there something weird or strange going on in London or England at the time uh, that we need to really reflect on? I would say a lot of the, the texts we've been reading say absolutely. With children? Yes, definitely, right? These kids are uh, still working in the mind, still working in unsafe conditions. So is that a possibility? I mean, hey, maybe it is. But um, the, so there's a lot of interpretations that I think we could we could take with this text, and um, there's there's different places to go and, and different things to pull from. Now, if you're just looking at the poem itself and you're not thinking about its broader context in through the looking glass, which is 
perfectly fair to do, then maybe you would come up with a different interpretation, and that's also perfectly fine as well. So um, I love this poem. I hope that this uh, lecture has made a little bit more sense for you just in terms of reading through the poem. I hope you guys enjoy it, and otherwise, email me if you need anything.